Well, hello everybody. It's me, Ethan Van Skyver, and uh, this is Comic Artist Pro Secrets. Are you guys ready to do this tonight? Are you ready? Are you ready to review Isom 2? <clears throat> Part 2 of the uh, ill-advised the ill-advised uh, story arc. So here we go. Here we go, guys. Get ready. Uh, this is uh, my cover here. Uh, and, uh, Eric July called me up and he just kind of said, Hey, uh, you want to, would you do a cover for ISOM? He said, could you work that into your schedule? I told him, yeah, in fact, I'll prioritize it. Uh, Eric and I were getting along uh, pretty well there. I wanted to help him out. I wanted to see the success of his brand. Uh, and I wanted this to work. Uh, and I asked him, I said, you know, so, uh, sure. I'll do a cover. And he's like, really? Like he was really, we were really nice to each other. It was, it was great. Um, and, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What's the book about? And, uh, Eric told me like, I, I swear to God, this is true. If you don't believe me about this, you're not going to believe me about anything. He said, uh, well, uh, Isom gets a utility belt. And I said, uh, oh, that must be a big story point. Like he was so proud of like Isom getting a utility belt. And he said it in a way that was like, he was kind of being smug about it. Like, no, he was not smug. Like, well, self-satisfied, I guess that is smug. He was kind of like, wait till you see what this utility belt does. And I was like, well, can I see a picture of the utility belt? He wouldn't show me that. Instead, he sent me over some drawings of uh, Bloodroof. Um, and they, I don't know who drew them, but nobody that he has working for him now. Um, they were uh, very primitive drawings. They were very simplistic. I mean, a, a good design. Uh, you know, she's a, um, uh, it's a, it's a nice design. Uh, and then these monkey men which I didn't like the design of. I don't know who designed the monkey men, but I saw them and went, these are gay. I don't want to, you know, all right, here we go. I'll try to make these look cool. Uh, they look, uh, they look over designed. Uh, I would say that like there, there's too much, like what are these things in their heads? Like, what is all this? Oh, they're bleeding lava. Okay. They got lava rocks coming out of them. All right. Sure. Um, but anyway, I, I drew this now. <clears throat> this is uh, my version of Isom. One thing that I will say um, in criticism of uh, Isom, the whole franchise in general, uh, is that there has been no clear, uh, recognizable version of this character. Everybody who draws Isom draws him completely differently all the time. And, and I think Eric needs to pull in the reins there. And, and somebody, and maybe it's going to be Kane and White, but you know what? Kane and White is guilty of this too. Kanan draws Isom completely differently every time he draws him. Um, so somebody is going to have to sit there and say, all right, this is this is what the character looks like, period. This is it. Uh, and just stick with that. Uh, it is uh, important that somebody does that. Let me hide this comment here. Sorry about that. Um, because uh, otherwise, everybody just kind of draws their version of a black guy. I mean, somebody, some people draw him like he's... Uh, uh, who's that, who's that guy? Dino Mike. Uh, they, <laughs> they draw that guy. Uh, other people, like I draw him a little bit more, uh, kind of, uh, uh, when I, when I think of Isom, what do I think of, uh, what's celebrity? I'm not even really sure. I just draw like a big, powerful, uh, black man, uh, very thick, you know, very thick around the shoulders. I, I try to make him look like a black Captain America. I think that's what I'm thinking when I'm drawing Isom. Black Captain America, that same kind of build. Uh, by the way, uh, <clears throat> this, like I said, this is my cover. So I turned in my cover. I, I worked hard on this. I did about a week of this, uh, pretty laborious, uh, work here trying to make blood Ruth look cool. I was trying to understand like what he, well, she emits some energy from her fingers. Uh, the description said, I had no idea what that meant. Like, what do you mean energy? Okay. So like electricity, that's kind of what I drew here. It's different in the book. Like I just finished reading the book that just tell me that she, just tell me that she, the blood comes out of her. That's really fucking weird. I, it's a weird thing to call energy. It's her blood. Uh, all right. And this is not blood. This is clearly electricity. So, like, you know, again, a little communication would have been helpful uh, with this. But overall, I like uh, I like her design and all that stuff. I like her. I think she's cool. I think this is a well-conceived cover. Why? Uh, why do I think this is a good cover? Um, all right. Because the hero is strong and he's fighting unlike the cover that we criticized last time the cover that we reviewed last time for isom number one he's not running away i mean the thing about the cover to isom number one is that 
villains are coming and our hero is fucking running away from them, uh, which is not encouraging. Most number one issues uh, of, uh, let me see, I have it here still. Thank you. The, the, actually, this cover, uh, this comic book, which we reviewed last time, was purchased um, by somebody for $4,000, uh, which I uh, appreciate. We're going to ship this out to them uh, this week, but he's run like he's running away like there this is number this is a number one issue where you're supposed to say look at this badass new superhero and right away we can see that this is the guy who would chicken out of a debate on the alex stein show like this is a guy who runs away from threats this is not encouraging this is not a good number one cover what we want is something like this like you see this and you kind of go all right our dude is badass there are threats here these are scary monkey men uh, and this guy here, he's handling business. This is a man who's handling business. And then we got a beautiful, sexy woman down here. Our eye is drawn here, though, right? The first thing we see is we see our main hero. That's the attention. Our attention is drawn to him. And then we look around and we see the beautiful woman here. Uh, very good. This is a solid cover, if I do say so myself. Now, I have received some criticism from Mike S. Midget. Uh, who has decided, fair play, to go over some of my artwork and criticize it, because uh, Mike hates me. Uh, and he uh, he did this thing. You can see it on Twitter. It's pretty funny. He like And he, he drew all over it, which is fine. You're allowed to do that. But he kind of said, uh, this arm is too long compared to this arm. And he's right about that. And I knew it when I did it. And this is the thing about criticism. Um, you know, valid criticism you know it's valid when you get it, right? You you know it's valid because, first of all, you're really close to your own artwork. And a lot of the times when you're making a mistake or when there is a mistake there, you're aware of it. Um, and this is absolutely true. Like, the monkey's head was so goddamn big that there was no way. Like, this forearm, this, the fist would have been hidden back here. His knuckles would have been poking out. So I went, I got to fudge it. I got to fudge the forearm, uh, and I made the forearm a little bit longer than this forearm. I guess I could have lengthened this forearm, but then he would have looked like one of these guys here with the super long arms. Uh, so Mike actually went in and he drew like, he exaggerated the length of the arm here and exaggerated the length of the arm here and then redrew a very funny figure of like ice on with like one regular sized arm and one super long. <laughs> Mike being a troll. Fuck you, Mike. You're stupid. Uh, but no, he is right. This forearm is too long here, but the, it's in service of the fact that like we've got to get it. We've got to get this thing in a headlock. This by the gigantic monkey man. Uh, and I don't think it stands out too bad. I think it works. So uh, fuck you. Uh, all right. So going in, uh, <laughs> uh, going inside here, inside the book. My, I better design this time. Uh, everything is kind of um, utilized to a, a purpose. Oh, I mean, I read it all, guys. I read this whole thing, and uh, it is painful. Eric July is every single character in this book. And um, they're all behaving uh, like middle managers squabbling over information and data. Now, this entire book, if you want to know like what the theme of the book is, uh, the book is people, some people think we need more information, and other people don't think we need information. Some people are good at collecting data. Other people are not so good at collecting data to their detriment. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of that in here. The, the conversation, the dialogue is absolutely excruciating in that way. And every single character sounds like uh, young Rip of 59. They all talk like him. Uh, it's... Uh, it, like I said, it is excruciating. We'll go through it. The Rip of our uh, ethic... All right. <clears throat> this comic book company was not created at random. This is Eric. I mean, I, it, it wasn't created at random. It, was, you know, it wasn't just, uh, it wasn't like the Big Bang Theory. Uh, Eric actually sat down and created it. That's great. Yeah, it's true. Uh, I've been rooted in the culture of American comic books since I was a youngster. And being a creative in the industry was always a dream of mine. Again, using the word the creative for some reason. Like, that's a word. I, I, I feel like I introduce words to Eric, and then he repeats them. I'm being a cre creative versus businessman. So he wants to be a creative. Could just say a writer. You know, being a creator is what most people say. Creatives. But the unfortunate state of the industry. Hold on a second here. This kicks my ass right here. But the unfortunate state of the industry gave me the push 
that I needed to give it a shot. See, this is the difference between me and, and maybe Eric July. Uh, you know what made me get into comics? I got into comics because it was so fucking competitive and there were so many great artists working. Like, it was so successful. It was so prosperous. It seemed like a real competitive, uh, creative atmosphere. Uh, and I wanted, I wanted in. Like, I wanted, let me see if I can zoom in a little bit here, if that makes any difference. I wanted in. Uh, I wanted to be a part of a, a super competitive, creative business, uh, and one in which everybody was making money. Like, that's what gave me the push, like 1991, 1992's Image Comics, watching that, wanting to be a part of that. That's what made me want to be a comic creator. Eric sees the, the comic book industry on its last legs in his mind, uh, and therefore, that's what gave him the push. Like, you know what? I've kind of thought about being a comic book creator. It's been a dream of mine since I was a youngster. Uh, but let me wait until it's too weak to tell me no. <laughs> <laughs> let me wait. Let me wait until everybody's leaving the comic book industry. Let me wait until that happens. And then <clears throat> that's the push that I need to give it a shot. Either that or there's kind of a savior uh, solution kind of a situation here. Like they need me. Uh, he says, uh, but the unfortunate state of the industry gave me the push that I needed to give it a shot. And then he writes this, which is really strange. At such a young age, Eric, you're 33 years old. Uh, Jesus had already completed his mission uh, by the time he was your age. Uh, most people get into comics, um, 19, 20, 21, 22. Uh, you're 33 years old. You think you're at a young age? Like, hey, listen, comics, getting into comic books is something we do at retirement age. Uh, but I'm 33. I'm a young man. I figure I better get into it now. Uh, bro. You're too old to be doing this. You're too old to be getting a start in this. Really. I mean, it happens sometimes, but making a point of saying that you're doing this at a young age drives me nuts. This is just a completely different mindset. Uh, we've seen what works, and we've certainly seen what not to do. I don't know what you mean by that. Ripoverse is the product of a comic book guy that still believes in the magic of the culture. Everything is goddamn vague all the time. Can you explain what is the magic of the culture? What culture? With that being said, we are guided by a set of principles that remain the staple of the company. Uh, and then you get respect the customer. In other words, block everyone who criticizes you on Twitter. Just block them brutally, immediately. Uh, that's uh, disrespecting the customer. This is bizarre. Canon and continuity. Uh, our aspirations extend far beyond... Uh, our, uh, beyond having a couple of characters or series. Oh, really? A vast universe that is ever expanding is what we hope to accomplish. This is something that has long been intriguing about modern comic books, but it has become a lost art. The Ripaverse will fill this void. So he's thinking about Marvel Comics and the, the huge amount of books that come out and the, uh, you know, the, uh, incredible universe that, that Stanley has created and it's it's persisted now since 1961. Uh, Eric is saying that's not happening anymore, and he's gonna he's gonna provide that. He's gonna provide. I, I don't know how he would do that. Like he he's going to provide something close to what Marvel Comics was in his mind in its heyday. He's gonna fill that void. Um, this means that every single book you buy will always matter. If retcons are to exist, we're we're not even two issues into his flagship book and he's already imagining that at some point sales are going to flag a little bit and they're going to have to retcon <sighs> Eric just relax and do tell your story man don't worry about retcons that's a weird thing to be thinking about right now uh, they will only be used in the classic sense of introducing new information. We want every book you buy to always matter. These stories happen. There'll be no lazy time travel to change histories or events. Why not? There will be no cheap multiverses. Blah, blah, blah. You're on the second issue of your book, and so far, I'm just, spoiler alert, nothing happened, okay? There's nothing that's happening in these comics. There's nothing that's happening. Concept will remain true regardless of the medium. Should the characters that we're already imagining, like, look, we're going to put, and this is actually valuable here. Should the characters appear in official, uh, officialized animation? Is officialized a word? That's interesting. 
uh, or live action. The depictions need to be as accurate to the characters as realistically uh, as possible. I would I would just say, you know, to that end, could you like please define like what your main character looks like? Because everybody, including Kane and White, draws them completely differently. All right. A comprehensive, like your favorite characters will always be recognizable. Yes, get started on that now. You're two issues in. Get started on that. Comprehensive timeline. Because we value canon and continuity, it's important uh, that you're able to follow the timeline as these characters grow. This will be especially helpful for those of you that become customers years after our founding. We promise to try to keep reboots to a minimum. How about to zero? Why are you thinking about reboots in a... <laughs> Everything is like, you know what? At some point, we might have to reboot all this shit, but we're going to try to keep that to a minimum. Why would you even say that right now? If this means that a series is on its 100th issue or volume, so be it. So we're going to listen, ice on number 100, which is definitely going to happen. Uh, so be it. But this isn't a reason to feel overwhelmed. There will be plenty of opportunities to purchase anthologies. We are way ahead of ourselves here. The combined key stories, but we don't want to hold your hand as picking up the pieces is often part of the fun. Not every story will be told in chronological order. Oh, so we'll always make it as easy as possible to keep up as the universe grows. And there's our July's autograph right there. That's a reprint of his autograph. It's on the and we got a nice shot of Darren here. This is pretty good. Of course, the background here is... Um, this is a dropped in asset. Somebody actually found Club Merc. Uh, that was on uh, Twitter today. Somebody actually found the asset for Club Merc. The interior and the exterior is a digital 3D asset. All right, here we go. I saw number two. Ill uh, by the way, ill-advised part two. I'm looking forward to part three now, having read this in a kind of like dreadful way. Like, I, I really want to see how this gets wrapped up um, because it right now. All right. Oh, previously, look at this. After receiving a concerning call from his sister, Avery Silman visits his old friend, Darren Fontano. Avery, in a pursuit of the missing girl, challenges Darren's knowledge of her whereabouts. The meeting turns violent. Being one of the most feared men in the city, Darren believes his bold action cannot go unchecked. Not only is Avery under threat, so is his family. Uh, okay, is that what happened? Uh, anyway, here he is. Thank you, everybody. I hope you enjoy Ice on number two uh, even more. You guys are awesome. Love you. Thank you. All right. Book starts out with uh, his sister in an elevator, and right away you get a taste of uh, you know what's going to happen here uh, in terms of uh, Eric July's dialogue. I mean, the dialogue is excruciating, and I, you know I'm I'm learning how to write myself. I you know I'm I'm not saying I'm a master writer. I am certainly not you know uh, Alan Moore or Grant Morrison, but um one thing that Eric could stand to do. Uh, is to say, how can I say this simpler? How can I simplify my dialogue here? We got Altona. I guess she's in an elevator, although there's no, you know, there's no evidence that it's an elevator. It's just she's standing somewhere, and she's got a headache, and then somebody next to her. You know what? Uh, the, for the artist, I'm sorry. I gotta, I gotta calm down. I just, I just finished reading this, guys. Let me just be calm here. Uh, for the artist. One thing that you may want to do is you may want to kind of um, remember that your first panel in a comic book, first two panels usually are establishing shots. The first one should give an overall location. It should be like um, a shot of the building that she's in, an exterior shot of the building. The next panel should be our uh, should include our character, and then we should see the environment that she's in. Okay, those two things are really, really good ways to ground the reader. So we would see the building that she's in from the outside. Next panel would be her standing in an elevator like this, just standing there. And then maybe there's another guy in there because there's another guy in there. He's here, and we can see that it's an elevator. We can see the buttons over here. We can see the door. We can see the little rail that's on the wall. And we see that they're in an elevator. That should be panel two. So this is the first you want to thoroughly established don't make people guess uh, and you can have that dialogue altona are you okay you can have that dialogue in this panel or you could even have altona are you okay on the initial shot of the exterior 
you can have it look uh, Altona, are you okay inside the building coming from inside the building we cut to this shot this dialogue is is uh, basically the way eric july writes because eric july can't just write a you look worried you okay uh you okay you worried about the merger that would have been fine too um what are you worried about the merger that would have been perfect here instead he writes though i've never seen you this way i know what stress looks like is this about the merger okay what do you mean though i've never seen you who talks like this who says though i know i've never seen you this way i know what stress looks like this would have been just fine just to say um yeah you look worried what are you what are you worried about the merger what are you stressing about the merger bitch uh she says uh what no i just had a long night i'm good i'm good which is an air julyism so it's just me, huh? Uh, yeah, you're the one who's worried about the merger. Uh, you've been on board longer than I have. This isn't our first purchase. But this one isn't some failed startup with a decent idea. This new territory worries me. Now, all through this book, uh, there are a lot of people talking about, like, bidness. Most of it is about the bidness. Uh, Altona goes into her office here. She does have thought balloons. So every now and then, uh, Eric has established that we will be uh, using thought balloons here, which is unusual. It's not really what, uh, you know, most comic books are into anymore. People don't use thought balloons. She goes in there and it's like, what the F? Uh, and then, aha. No, ah, ah, says a guy here. You reach into that purse, we're going to have problems. Uh, assuming that uh, she has a gun in her purse, I guess. And here you have uh, Darren, who's sitting at her desk for some reason, and more of this, uh, more of this weird abstract dialogue that's sort of like a squirrel trying to uh, keep track of an idea. But thanks for joining us. Cozy spot you have here. You've done well for yourself. This is just her office, dude. It's not her home. Dude, this is not her uh, home. It's just her office where she works. What do you mean that she's done well for herself? She didn't build this. Uh, don't ponder too hard trying to figure out what's taking place here. I, I wish I'd really taken this to heart, um, this line of dialogue here, when I started reading this book. Because I read it very carefully, and then sometimes I would read the dialogue aloud. Because I wanted to, like, literally every balloon is like an air balloon. Every balloon is a fucking Zeppelin. Like, it is just air. These balloons are just pumped up with, like, air. They don't really say anything, ever. It's a lot of double speak. A lot of vague generalities, a lot of implied threats. Uh, don't ponder too hard trying to figure out what's going on here. I need your full attention. Again, could have been written as, uh, pay attention to me. Uh, don't worry about him. Look at me. That would have been fine, too. More than likely, you put him up to this. I figured we'd catch up in proprietor persona. How's little Vassy, by the way? I'm sorry, what? She hasn't said a word now except for what the fuck. And he's already like, he's all over the place. I uh, Thank you for being here. I really like your office. It looks like you've done well for yourself. Don't think too hard about what's trying to take place here because I need your full attention. Uh, more than likely, you put him up to this. Who? I don't know. Um, I figured we'd catch up in person. By the way, how's your how's your daughter? Let her Let her answer any of these things, dude. Darren, I swear to God, if... She says, and then he bitch smacks her as hard as he can for no fucking reason <laughs> and knocks her on the ground. <laughs> you ain't doing nothing. Now get the fuck up, he says. I just feel like something could have led. I don't know. I just feel like this guy is, uh, Darren is, Darren's a unique retard. Uh, all right. Your involvement aggravates me because... You should know better. This sounds like a text he might have sent me. Uh, we'll handle him when we find him, but him, uh, again, we'll handle Isom. We'll handle Avery. We'll handle a Mr. Silman. Any, uh, Veg, who? Who? The reader needs to know. This is like, uh, we'll handle that certain person uh, when we find him. We'll handle... Uh, but I need some answers. I watched that brother of yours do some real athletic stuff. Apparently, he took out my except. How did he do it? 
I have no idea what you're talking about. Woman, you got the nerve to play stupid with me? Oh, you pull out your gun now? All right, that's enough. And then suddenly, again, make no mistake. And we have a hero here, I guess, who is the founder of Projexus, which is, I guess, where this is going on. This is taking place at Projexus, one assumes. There's no word, there's no uh, little caption that says this is Projexus headquarters, I don't think. Did I miss it? Nope. Nope. So I think this is Projexus, and this guy is the founder. His name is Lincoln... Oh, the names, dude. The names are a punishment. Uh, Lincoln uh, UC Bio. And he says, make no mistake, you're only here because I allowed you to be. I uh, That must sound real tough, but you let him into a woman... You then you allowed this criminal and his armed men uh, to invade your female employee's office, wave guns around, and then assault her. You're a real tough guy, man. I'm sure this was this plan. <laughs> I can't take it, dude. What is the plan? Damn, says Darren. Now, Lincoln. This is why he did this. It's like, well, why did you let, why did you let this criminal gangbanger, this pimp, why did you let him into your project projectsis? Like, this is a big technology firm, I guess. I don't really know what it is, but it sounds like a tech, a tech firm. And you've got, met, like, whatever it is here, like, you're creating bioweapons or something. I don't know what it is, but you've got, like, a bunch of dudes that are, like, armed to the teeth with, like, automatic weapons. So this isn't like, uh, this isn't Amazon. You know what I mean? Like, this isn't like, uh, you're not working at Twitter headquarters. Like there's something's going on here and you let a pimp gangbanger for some reason come into the office and threaten your female employee. Why? I just needed to see what you were up to. So this is what it's all about. All through this book, it's people trying to collect data or not trying to collect data. They're trying to understand what other characters are doing. Nobody seems to know what anyone is doing in here at all. I mean, if you feel like when you read Isom that you don't know what anybody's doing or talking about, you're not the only one. The characters in the book also have no idea what anyone is doing here or what they're talking about. Nobody does. And then and more of this, it just really does feel like Eric July. By the way, I fired every one of those backstabbing moles. Uh, I hope you paid them well backstabbing moles this really does sound just like uh sounds like friday night tights a little bit sounds like uh you know uh by the way um all those backstabbing moles i got rid of uh oh maybe he means like cancerous moles on your back no he means backstabbing moles like people who are given information he's got like this pimp has information he had this pimp has contacts within Projexus and he's paying them and uh to give information about Projexus again seeking information and Lincoln found out about them and he fired them this is all great stuff uh escort him through uh through the front I want everybody to see it but before you go and then boom he punches him in the stomach don't ever put your hands on anyone working for this company too late he already did too late dude he socked a woman across the face. You're going to hit him in the gut for that? Like, all this sounds tough, I guess, to Eric. I, I just, that almost hurt. You know you messed up, right? You know you messed up, he says on his knees. Shut up and move. The disparity of power here is interesting, and the just the cluelessness. I, I, I don't understand why this guy... This would be like, uh, essentially, this would be like Elon Musk. This is Elon Musk, and this is Eric July. You know what I mean? Like, this is Elon Musk, and Eric July is uh, somehow involved in Elon Musk's business. He's This guy's a pimp and a hustler. This guy is the founder of a major technology firm. How do these people, how are they in a fight together? I guess we'll find out. Should be fascinating. By the way, the original... <laughs> I don't have the cover that uh, Kane and White did, which is very funny. 
the cover that Kanan White did uh, had uh, Isom fighting this monster whose name is Chadran. Somebody should do kind of a data check and find out like where this name came from. All, all the names are come from somewhere in Eric life. Uh, so who is Shadran? And they're fighting in an alley. And there's like a, a little, there's a, a blurb, a hype blurb. And hype blurbs are something that are really from the past. They don't really exist to like anywhere, but uh, anymore. Like they're kind of outdated, kind of like thought balloons are. But I mean, they they should usually say like senses shattering action. You know, it's like um, uh, bloody battles the way you like them, served up rip a verse hot. Like it should say something like that. It says inside, find out why Isom quit. <laughs> that's the feature that that's the hype blurb on the cover find out why he quit i can't wait to find out why my superhero quit being a superhero it's exciting i like it i like it when people give up and i want to know why i i enjoy finding out why people give up on being a uh, heroic uh so that was the hype blurb Anyway, this is why, like if you were, if you read that hype blurb and you, uh, you got into this, uh, to read why, to find out why he quit, uh, this is why. So we have a nice convention sequence here. And again, there's a lot of weird stuff in here. A lot of concerns of Eric's like, uh, this is a convention. You've got kind of a fat nerdy ginger, and then you've got kind of a hot blonde chick and, um, they're trapped here. Everything's a wreck. And he said, that thing looks like one of the brigaders from the silo comics. And she says, who? And he goes, what? You're wearing it. And I, Eric doesn't finish this thought, but he really should have. If this is, if this was important enough for him to say this, uh, what you're wearing a costume from the brigaders comic book. You don't know, uh, or wait, uh, you're wearing a costume from the silo comic book. You don't know what a brigader is fake geek girl. You should have said that, which is what this panel is all about. But if you don't know, you have no idea what this guy's talking about. I know what he's talking about because I know these are Eric July's concerns and the concerns of people in this space. There are a lot of fake geek people out there that are just pretending. They're just using cosplay to get attention. But this isn't a comic book now. This isn't one of Eric's comics, these concerns. Anyway, here comes Isom. He lifts. What does he lift? I guess he lifts like their cover away from them. It's all good. You're safe now. He lies. Thanks so much, man. Uh, who are you? How, so apparently nobody knows who Isom is. Even in Isom's prime, like uh, people don't know who he is. Who are you? Did you kill that thing? He says, not exactly. I mean, not exactly is, is a good way of saying no. No, not at all. Because he's right here. Did you kill that thing? Not exactly. You can call him Isom. The area is being secured and it's still a madhouse outside. I'm just here to save any stragglers. Um, she says, that was the most chaotic thing I've ever seen. I'm positive I saw that thing kill one of the officers. It happened so fast and then everything just stopped. This place cleared out in an instant, but we couldn't make it to the exit. I thought for sure we were left for dead. Here's Isom. I got here as fast. This, this dialogue could all be coming from one person. It's all the same speak. This is a teenage girl speaking, and she sounds just like Isom does. I got here as fast as I could, but I assumed there was no way that everybody got out. Wait a second. I got here as fast as I could, but I assumed there was no way that everybody got out. But... I got here as fast as I could, but what? <laughs> his thoughts don't connect. Uh, let's get you out of here and I'll keep. And then over his shoulder, run, he says. Now here's Shadran. I mean, the one thing I will say about this art is uh, it's weird. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> the, the cover that Kanan did. Um, featuring Isom fighting this character is so much cooler. Like the guy's like uh, about a head taller. He's bigger and he should be like, this guy is, uh, short. He's small. He's, he looks weird here. It's bizarre. 
His musculature is, is very strange. It's a 3D figure. It's a 3D asset, you know, uh, with weird anatomy. But, I mean, really, Shadran should fill up this whole space here uh, so that we're overwhelmed by his presence. Uh, he, we're not overwhelmed by his presence here at all. I don't know why, I don't know why he's this small. I also don't know if this is his ass or his crotch. Is this his ass and this is his leg, or is this his crotch right here? Is this his dick, or is that his ass? You see what I'm saying? Like, is that his back leg or his front leg? I could look at that for a long time and try to work that out. Now, here's his torso. So it really would appear that this is his uh, this is his penis right here. That's what it would appear because, but it looks like it could be. I don't know, man. By the way, um, Isom, look at, his, look at his ass. I don't know why this is kind of like, look at this flat ass, dude. Comes all the way down here. One of his ass cheeks is super droopy. It's like he's wearing a saggy diaper that leaks. Yeah, uh, you see what I'm saying. Run, he says. Uh, they do run. Uh, they both... Here's the thing. The action here is in intense. Run, he says. This is the standoff page. The next panel should be ice on punching this guy, but it isn't. It's uh, them, a redundant shot of them both looking at the kids running away. This is redundant. And the reason why it's redundant is because it's here. It's here, right here. We already see them running away. And then we got to have an extra panel of him and them looking. And then I saw him kind of goes, boom, punches him, I guess, wham. And he's like, ow. And then he looks again, and the kids aren't really any further away. There's another panel of him looking at the kids. Um... Looks like uh, at this point, uh, Shadran says "um umbalor," which I think is the N word in his native tongue. I don't know what it is, but I, I what it is is a slur because he says, "What? What'd you call me?" He knows umbalor. Uh, he's calling him a uh, derogatory name. Oh God, this is just. Fun. And th by the way, this is like some of the best stuff in the book, to be honest with you. All right, here's the thing. This is this breaks the 180 rule. Here's what the 180 rule is. I'm going to try to explain this. You can see that the kids are going this way, right? The kids are going this way. This is where we are. We're positioned over here. We're looking, you know, this way at the kids. Uh, camera angle breaks. So we're all the way on the other side of him. We go from here to here. And then he runs this way. Now, just based on the way that we're situated, based on where the artist has put us, he is running away from the kids here, according to this panel. He's running away. It's dizzying. It looks like he's running away from the kids. Um, but no, he's running towards the kids. He grabs the girl by the hair. Uh, Isom comes and hits him in the back. He falls forward and, I don't know, crushes her vagina. Ah! She says. Isom goes, oh no, not her pussy. And then he uh, cradles her. And Shadron laughs. Uh, like, I don't... I don't I, uh, this is why he quit, because he's a terrible superhero. He's bad at it. He could have just, like, I don't know, rescued her. I don't know what, but... Shadran then, Shadran then suddenly is on, okay, no, again, the 180 rule is broken, we're here, and then suddenly we're completely on the other side of them, as Shadran appears to have scooted around, but it's not, the camera just moved 180 degrees, as Shadran punches Isom, and there he goes, and then, um, he says, Olamang, uh, which is this uh, creature's native language for faggot. So he uh, now called him the N-word, and he called him the F-slur. Please help me, she says. And then he says, Shadre. And Isom says, no. And uh, he punches him ineffectually on the back of the head. 
Uh, hurts Lysom's hand. He bitch smacks Lysom. By the way, the backgrounds, of course, are all 3D assets here. They're, they're awful. This is the warehouse 3D background that's being used here for the convention center that we've, we've found. We've identified it. It's on the uh, bitch smacks uh, Isom, and then Isom, I don't know, lands on his ass. And then, I, I don't know, he's still, I don't know why the creature wants to kill this girl. Uh, but I guess he does. I don't, I don't know. We see a shadow. We see this weird shot. Of, no. Uh, this hand is up first, and then it's the other hand. So, in other words, he's doing this. No. As he runs towards her. And this big shadow, I think, indicates that maybe he crushed her head or something like that. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> that was terrible. That was hard. Like, this whole thing doesn't... Like, it's so weird, man. It really is weird. The book is weird. I just sense autism in it. As I read it, I feel like the autism. All right. Uh, he comes home, and then there's some monsters in his place. All right, who cares? They set fire to his place. And we can skip all that, I guess. It's not important. These monsters. And then here comes Goodjing. Now, uh, I did point out, this is the splash page introduction of Goodjing. I, I guess it's, or it's Gooding. And once again, Eric uh, Weathers, who is the letterer. <laughs> I got I bust Eric Weathers' balls about this. Eric Weathers is also my letterer on Cyberfrog. Uh, and um, Eric Weathers does a really, really good job on my book. I think he knows that my book is great, and that's why he does a much better job. Uh, you see the exciting lettering that's in my book here. Do I do I ever introduce a character or need him to do a logo? No, but I mean, bang, the big, you know, big gigantic effects everywhere that you look. Um, oh, no, here, here's perfect. Uh, Scorpinra, a.k.a. Scorpion, big letters here. Uh, that are, you know, in, in proportion with the size of the character on the page. There you go. Perfect example here. Uh, introducing a character with a kick-ass kind of logo. Scorpinra, alien name, a.k.a. Scorpion. There he is on the bridge leading into Philadelphia. It's covered in, like, dry human skin. The Vespus hive ships are in the air. Uh, and that's just exciting. All right. Here we go. Gooding. <laughs> it's not that there's nothing else on the page it's just gooding <laughs> little i mean you know what could have been is it, it could have been like gooding like in the background here gooding and what is the name gooding anyway here it is people have pointed this out and, and made hay of all this but first of all gooding is a horrible fucking name i don't know where he gets these names every single name that he chooses for these characters is embarrassing Every single, every single one of them is kind of hard to pronounce. Like, what do you mean, goody ying with ng? That every one of them is kind of impossible to pronounce. You don't really know how to pronounce it. You take a guess, and even if you did know how to pronounce it, it's not a superhero character name. None of these characters have interesting names at all. And and the reason for that is I think they're all Eric's friends, or they're like it's a reference to somebody in Eric's life or his family history. Or he's already pointed out that Isom comes from his great 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 grandfather. So uh, who's Gooding? I don't know. I don't know where this comes from, but it's it's spelled differently throughout the book. Here it's G O O Good, and then Y N G. So maybe it's Gooding. It's just awful. Change the name. Uh, all right, <clears throat> this here. Uh, this is what happens when you are using. And people say to me, you know, Ethan, why why bust the balls of people who are using uh, 3D assets? Uh, for many reasons, uh, laziness, you know, all these things, like people really should be trying to draw and create authentic comic book art. I mean, say what you will. Mike S. Miller, of course, points out that this arm, this forearm here is a little too long. It's longer than this one. True. There's a reason for that. Obviously, as I explained, we want to, okay, so I fudged it a little bit here, but there's no 3D asset here. I drew this. I drew this. I drew these figures. I drew them all. And if they're imperfect, that's okay because they came from me. They're drawings. It's art. It's just art, you know? It's not, like, boring, like, you know, perfectly created, like, uh, you know, 3D figures that I've traced over or that I... It's not like that. You draw. You sit down and you draw, man. That's what art is. That's what comic book art is. 
Now, when you're using 3D assets, you can take a figure and you can pose it in any position that you want. And then you can also turn it around uh, and look at it from any angle. You can look at it from any angle. So what you have here, and I, I got gaslit about this on the internet from some clown, some uh, ripetard, who said, no, he's not running here, he's landing. He's landing? Where did he jump from? What do you mean he's landing? He jumped out of one of these tiny little things here? These are small. These are little drones. No, he's running, dude. See the, see the, and then see this? And then see this, you asshole? He's running. And this was, somebody took a 3D figure, the artist took the 3D figure and he, he was like, it'll be really clever if like I shoot it from below. Then it's action packed. That looks great until you put the background there and you forget where the horizon line is. And now here's the horizon line. Now he's marching straight up in the air. It's supposed to be like this. And then like, honestly, the, um, the ground plane is like right here. The camera would be underground looking up at him. Okay, you see what I'm saying? This would be a buried fucking Citizen Kane style camera shot where the camera is below the sur below the horizon line, looking up at a guy running at an angle. His body should be almost a 45 degree angle from the ground. Look at this. And why is this? Because he just had a 3D asset. He turned the camera in a weird way. He kind of popped it down there, added the, and then he just went, well, fuck, where's the ground? Uh, let me just put it here. Let me just put the... No, that's... No. That drives me nuts. You see what I'm saying? The camera would be way down here underground looking up at him. If you're seeing a guy running and you can see his belly and everything like that, you're underneath him if he's running like this. He's running like this. You see this? 45 degree angle from the ground. This is correct. So that's the problem. I mean, that's that's the problem with the 3D assets. Problem with using 3D assets is um, when it comes to uh, humans, 3D figures, is that there is no horizon line to reference. Uh, and then, you know, you just have the figure and then you've got to work out how to put that into, if you don't know how to do it, you're going to end up with things like this. Uh, so, uh, all right. Who cares? This guy shows up gooding. Oh, I like this right here. All right, so this is Alpha Core. Now, I have not reviewed Alpha Core. I don't have Alpha Core. I have not read Alpha Core. Uh, first of all, hard cut, by the way. Um, we're going to go in here and let's uh, engaging. Let's go into the fiery building. Oh, that's great. Next page should be them putting out the fire. The next page after this should be them fighting the fire. They're going into the fire, so they should be like... Pfft. Spraying the fire, carbon dioxide everywhere. Spraying the fire, putting it out. But it's not. Hard cut from there to this. Why are we not seeing him put the fire out? I don't know. Because we're cutting, we're, we're going to Alpha Core. Headquarters. Where for three pages, these idiots squabble about data collection. This, I mean, if you read this, it really is... It really is amazing. This is headache inducing. I'm going to read this page to you. Uh, and you will see what I'm talking about. This entire book is about who has data, who needs data. We need more data. We don't know anything. You know, it's really like reassuring. It's like, we don't know anything as readers and neither do they. They don't know anything either. Nobody knows nothing here. And they just sit around and they, they squabble about shit the way that like, uh, Certain certain YouTubers do. Not many, maybe two. Uh, all right. Let's... You guys are superheroes. You guys are now doing a... You, you guys are superheroes. And you're meeting up here for a very inspiring... This is your, your three pages to shine here in ISOM number two. Uh, you're meeting up here for a very inspiring debriefing. Not debriefing. They're reviewing uh, what happened uh, yesterday. Uh, <clears throat> All right, let's address the disaster of yesterday. This is like a company meeting that we get. Like they're superheroes having a corporate company meeting 
talking about, you know, the uh, where they went wrong. This is all great stuff. I can't wait to read AlphaCore. Yeah, it's like a Zoom meeting. Exactly. Thank you very much, Young Butternut. There were several miscalculations here. We weren't on our game. And it could cost us. It could. It Did it cost you? Did, then why are we just now debriefing? We generally address the mission right after completion. That's a great point to bring up. Thank you. Yeah. Why are we now? Uh, this is very important for the reader to know. Apparently, there was a delay in the debriefing. Why are we? Why didn't we immediately do this debriefing? Why was there a delay? Normally, that's what we do. You're saying there were several miscalculations. We weren't on our game. It could cost us. Well, then, why why did we wait to have this debriefing? Usually, according to our protocol, uh, we, we do this bullshit right after uh, the completion of the meeting. And then he's got to answer that fucking annoying comment from this bitch here this mission is not complete. I spent the rest of the day going through my contacts on my iPhone and preparing for this very meeting. Okay, so shut up. That's why. Uh, you know why we didn't have it right away? Because I was going through my contacts and preparing to have this debriefing uh, where we would talk about where we failed. Any other questions, you fucking witch? Valdez, what we are dealing with here is a very serious matter that could be beyond your understanding. Oh, maybe maybe you don't know what the problem is. You're very smart, but listen, after uh, spending the day reviewing the situation, you might not know what's going on here. She says, I don't doubt the seriousness at all. You're fired. Get the fuck out of here. I'm trying to talk about what we did yesterday and what we've learned. Stop, stop, squib, stop it. Stop with your little, your quibbles. Stop with your back talk. <clears throat> and again, this is more Eric July, not naming names, using pronouns, pronouns, uh, rather than just say, uh, you know, what the character's name is. Who are you referring to? Let me know who you're talking about. She says, I heard about her. Even did some surface level research. More talk about research, but not enough, just surface level. I heard about her. Say Yaira. Say the blonde bitch we fought yesterday. Her. Who? The only other female that do you mean Altona? Because we were we were reading about Altona. Do you mean her? No, you mean a different her? But clearly there's plenty that I'm not aware of. Well, that's true. That's true of all of us. There's a lot of things that we, for all the things that we know, I think it's important uh, that as we educate ourselves, we realize that there's so much more that we don't know. Uh, clearly, clearly there's a lot that we're not aware of. Uh, what do you know that I don't? He's about to tell you. He's trying to tell you that he might. Th this is now five panels. That would be the only relevant information at the moment. Well, if you would shut your fucking cockhole for one second, I would tell you what I found out through looking through my contacts in my iPhone, but you won't shut the fuck up. Uh, I don't need to be reminded of your investigative talents, he says. You're good at getting data, normally. Braxwell spoke highly of them. And truth be told, it's the only reason you're wearing that suit. And he just flattered. He just said, uh, bro, be great to Braxwell. So we have a panel of Braxwell receiving that validation without saying a word and smiling. Because he said, look, Braxwell, I trust Braxwell. You know, he said that you're really good at collecting data. And that's why you're here. And Braxwell's like, hell yeah. Hell yeah. I'm not saying that as an insult. It's your strength, so make sure you listen carefully. By all indications, there is relatively limited intel. She showed up a few years ago, and I was summoned to deal with her. Yaira. There's Yaira. Rarely am I ever tested when given the opportunity. I gave her the out. She took it, and now we see that she ignored our negotiation. If you let her go, you must not believe her to be evil. But we watched her drop a man from Lord knows how high. Somehow, I get the feeling 
you don't still see her as a threat. He says, she's a threat, just not to us. We're badasses. She's a threat, but like not to us. She handed you your asses yesterday. This is cope. This is all cope. Uh, I did not simply let her go this time. Braxwell and I went into pursuit after she nearly killed that man. All of this is, there. nothing is being said here. Nothing is being said here. And then, after all of this, the dude threatens to rape the black guy. And the black guy's used to it. Valdez, you'll eventually learn that the battlefield is more than just intel and information. But keep me abreast of your findings. Oh, by the way, before that, I have, I have a big criticism I have of this team is our lack of data collection. More references to collecting data, information. This is research, information, data. We need to collect more data. Uh, and then he says to this guy here, he says, I'm going to get some training in. You know the drill. That means his dick, dude. He puts his hand on this guy's shoulder and he says, I'm going to get some training in. You know the drill. And this guy knows. And that's part of being on the team. More data. You know the drill. He's like, I know it all too well. <laughs> it's like 23 inches long. Uh, all right. <clears throat> We're looking at uh, ISOM in bed. All right. Who cares about any of this? Uh, now it's spelled goodying with a Y, uh, with an extra I, by the way, of course. Uh, you know. Uh, we got two pages of uh, Avery taking a nap. This is really important. I've, I've never really seen this in a superhero comic book before where we actually witness the hero going to sleep. Because, I mean, superheroes need rest, you know. So uh, he says, thank God there ain't another set of those to light my actual house on fire. So the house that was lit on fire isn't his actual house. Surprise, he has another house, which is a 3D asset. Here's the, the truck, which, of course, is a huge part of this comic book, enormous part of this comic book. He goes to sleep here for a couple of pages, only to be woken up by his sister, who lets him know that Darren punched her in the face, and now uh, he's really mad. All right. More uh, weird threats, vagaries. I got to skip some of this. Uh, this is amazing right here. Now we cut. Okay, so as if the Alpha Core thing was, like, not meaningless enough, now we cut to uh, an arena here. Overhead shot of an arena. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Monday Night Elevation. And here we have a bunch of guys uh, talking about a fight that's going to happen. We got a full-page splash of an arena uh, where, man, this is weird. God damn, this is weird. When I got to this, I, I didn't know what to say. This is a splash page of the uh, entrance where the wrestler, his name is Larry Shungite. Larry Shungite, the wrestler. Shungite. Is that like Shug Knight? Like misspelled like the wrong way? Like Shug Knight, Shungite? It sounds like bat shit. Like it sounds, it, it sounds like some kind of like fossilized poop. Larry Shungite. We got a nice splash page of people going, yeah, all right. The door that he's going to come out. And then the next panel is like a, we got a grid here, a little shot of this guy who looks like Graham Nolan who comes out. Why, why isn't this, why isn't this the reveal of Larry Shungite? If he's a, he's a big deal. Uh, Larry gets into the ring. We don't know who this guy is. We have no idea. Uh, and he just comes out and he basically, uh, I don't know, what is he saying? Last night I lost something that was rightfully mine, but you only know a fraction of the story. When some of the top talent jump ship, who helped carry this company? Me. What is this? When wrestlers who had nowhere near the draw I have kept top billing, I kept my thoughts to myself. I gave you classic match after classic match. You didn't give me the belt. It was rightfully mine. I'll tell you what, how about you bring your punk ass out here and tell the great people of Flores Park exactly why I'm no longer champion. What? What does this have to do with Isom? Uh-oh, he's gone rogue. And then we cut to these guys who are watching it on TV. What is this? Eric, what is this? Who is this guy? 
Why do we have so many pages of this? What is this? None of this connects. And I think what uh, you know Eric thinks is that he's going to use this comic book. He's going to take breaks in the story to reveal more characters that could have their own comic books later. But like, I don't want a Larry Shungite comic because he's just a guy saying, I deserve my belt. The people of Texas give it. I don't want to read some put upon wrestler. I, I don't, I don't care about that. What does that have to do with, what does that have to do with any of this? Uh, then we cut to this guy here. Now this scene is actually pretty good. I will say this. I got to this and I really liked it. Aside from famously, uh, and, you know, this is how the uh, 3d assets thing was discovered. Uh, this is a 3d asset of a doorway, probably an elevator door. There's a little uh, switch here that's hovering in midair. Uh, this is supposed to be a metal detector. If you've been um, to a lot of places with metal detectors, uh, you'll know there'll be a table here, usually. A table here. Uh, so that, you know, uh, it kind of blocks it. You have to go through the metal detector. And you'll put your keys in a little bucket here, you know. Put your keys in your phone there so it doesn't set the metal detector off. This is an elevator door that was repurposed uh, as, um, you know, as a metal detector but really um you could have just i mean you could have just drawn that it, that's not that's not what they look like uh past you're supposed to go through here and then i guess into an elevator or out a door it's just the doorway to get out why do you have to why is there a metal detector to leave the place uh but anyway uh he uh because they're going into a garage right this is where the cars are they're going to leave why is there a, why do they have to go through a metal tech detector to leave the building that's a head scratcher there i don't know but it's important that they do because uh his he goes beep 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 this guy's got a gun uh, it turns out and it's like yeah i got a gun i don't care i'm not going to stop they ain't stopping me turn uh we see uh this is excruciating too uh this is clearly yaira here in the she says some things about wanting to join their their company. And it's just, it all of this stuff is just like really, really like ground level, like people talking up, people getting jobs, talking about getting jobs. Um, what's going on, Sally? What brings you in so late? I left those schematics in the office. I wanted to look uh, them over tonight. Funny you mentioned that. I'll be seeing Burnley later tonight. You thought about accepting our offer? Of course, I've considered it. But the consultant role is working out perfectly. I do appreciate carving me out my own space. The accommodation makes it difficult to decline. There's got to be a quicker way to say that or a way to make that sound interesting. I'll keep you posted. I've got some ideas that you're going to love. Let's get out of here. And then she's smiling. So she's going to, this is Yaira. She's got blue hair here. She's got some ideas. They're going to fuck these guys up, I guess, in their company. But anyway, they leave. And this is a really good scene. Uh, as I said, wait a second here. This is the gun. Never bring your gun to work. Gun. Lincoln has the gun. Why does this guy have a gun too? Did I read this wrong? So this guy's a traitor to the Projectus movement here. Uh, this is uh, this is actually pretty cool. They got um, uh, for some reason. Darren's guys are gonna kind of attack him and then they're it's like oh you're a mole and then this guy's i think this guy's got a gun too but he got through the detector and it didn't go off and then this happens uh that's lincoln going through the lincoln smashes through so they crash the car lincoln smashes through the windshield and then we cut to uh isom who goes and gets a gun and i don't know why there's there's no reason for him to do this he goes, he gets a gun, he puts it in his waistband, he puts on sunglasses and leaves. He doesn't use the gun, ever. Doesn't happen. Uh, and then here we go, we've got the wife of the farmer guy that looks like Eric Weathers, who shows up, she's looking for her husband. Uh, they go uh, to Gooding, for some reason, Gooding knows. Uh, it appears that the uh, demons stole the, the Sam, his name is. We don't know why that ever happened. It's, it's, it's excruciating here. Uh, another scene of him sleeping. Uh, this is Gooding again, who's saying, look, uh, it's interesting. These guys have special, special thing in their blood, uh, here, you know, that makes it, I've never seen anything like it. Um, 
we're training, we're, we get our new costume, and here it is. This is it. This is what Eric spoiled for me. He opens his costume up. This is the big moment. I'm disgusted by the old design of your waistband. <laughs> it was, wait, I'm disgusted by your old costume. It was rather pointless. I've given you a belt with actual utility. Yes, he's got his utility belt. Woo! I love it. This is, I'm so excited about this. No wonder Eric couldn't show me this. I would have stolen the design. I, you know, if you, if I'd seen the utility belt, I would have been like, damn, dude, I got a sneak peek of that. I'm putting it on Cyberfrog. Try it on. And when you're ready, I have some ideas for attachments. Uh oh. Attachments to the belt. Are they big black latex attachments? What are you looking for? I have some ideas for dot, dot, dot attachments. <laughs> I got some things that you could attach to that belt. Uh, it's like a big black dong, but it has a fist at the end. Hey, that would be cool if like his belt could have attachments like that. Um, kind of like green arrow has, uh, attachments on his arrows, like a fit, like a boxing glove arrow. Uh, anyway, this is the utility belt. I don't know what's in the utility belt. Nothing right now. I guess he says, when you're ready, I have some ideas for it. I don't, I don't know what's in there. He doesn't, it doesn't say like, we don't learn here. You know, uh, here comes the truck. Truck is hugely important here. Lots of scenes of the truck. This is, of course, a 3D asset. Uh, you can see that this is basically the same as this. Same angle. Ford Tough. Uh, all right. This is obviously the worst thing in the world here. This is the castle. Uh, and I've gone over this. This is this is one of the things that I think uh, caused uh, me and Eric to fight. I, I actually looked at this uh, page. It was on Twitter, and I just asked people to redraw it because uh, this is terrible. Uh, this is a truck that's pulling up to a, a spooky anachronism of a castle uh, in the middle of Texas somewhere, right? See all the fog around? I can't see Jack. The fog clears, and there's like this enormous, you would think, castle that the truck pulls up to, and it really looks like a bounce house or something like that. It looks terrible. I mean, it really looks like shit. And there are a million different ways that you could you could draw this, and, and you guys did. I mean, there are so many people who got involved in this and actually redrew this page and made it look amazing. They made it just look great. I mean, Eric didn't like that I did that. But I mean, again, this is like another one of those teachable moments where you get a script and you really need to sell it. The truck pulls up to this bizarre castle after the fog clears. Strange castle. I mean, if you just say the word strange castle, um, you know, right there, that should just implant all kinds of visual ideas. You type that into uh, the some AI program, and they're going to give you something better than this. You'll see. I mean, just type that into, like, uh, uh, Ford Raptor truck pulls up to bizarre castle with a drawbridge down. And they, uh, you know, AI is going to show you all kinds of crazy cool layouts for what that could have looked like. And instead, it looks like this. And uh, you know, as we examine it, like I really don't know uh, what this is. Like the, people are still trying to figure out what these tea kettles are here with the handle. Like this is something that you would lift up. There's a hinge here, so you lift this up, and then I guess this opens up. Like this pulls the lid open, and inside are cookies or coffee creamer or sugar don't know uh he runs up to the castle uh these are <laughs> these are funny i like these uh you can find like um somebody did a book a while ago uh, uh you know they collected these images from 100 years ago of uh photography like early filmmaking and, you know, they would sit there and they'd capture a horse in motion so that you could really, they slowed it down to frame so that you could see what a horse's anatomy looks like when it runs, how its legs move together frame by frame. And they had human beings running too. And that's what this reminds me of. Like, this looks like it was traced from that, but I don't really know. Anyway, it looks dumb. All right, thank you. Uh, here is Sidney Bloodruth. Um, this is fine. He, he sent me this in black and white. 
as a part of one of the assets that I needed to use to draw from to do the cover. So I, I saw this a while ago, just the line art of this, and went, ah, it's going to be this kind of a book. Um, together, uh, they go into uh, hell. They go into a cave. Sydney, Sydney has blood that comes out of her fingernails. This is what could have been explained to me a little bit better. Her powers are that she has blood that comes out of her fingernails, and that blood can do things. Like, pff, now I got a light. I lit up the cave, and I can see all the monkey men. Uh, Isom fights the monkey men. Uh, he's fighting the monkey men pretty hard here. Uh, and she's like, uh, he goes, I'm searching this cave for Sam. So they're looking for Sam. For some reason, Sam is in this cave. We don't know why. Uh, you can leave if you're scared. And she says, ha, then give me a minute. And she says, um, it's been a while since I've tried this. And he's still fighting down here. This is this is silliness. He's still fighting. She says, uh, she's at the top of this. She goes, it's been a while since I've tried this. And then she kind of lets blood come out of her fingernails a lot. She crosses her hands in front of her. She flings the blood and goes, Aye! and uh, that's it. That was... Uh, Thanks for doing that. That that did absolutely nothing. You that didn't kill any monkey men. Uh, that didn't really appear to do anything at all. What is that? What did she do? Like I thought she would like knock down like twenty eight monkey men with that, but it did. Uh, it did uh, nothing there. It's been a while since she's done that too. Uh, and then he he oh, he's fighting more monkey men. There's a lot of fighting. This is actually cool because there's a, a lot of action, but like the original book, um, the action can oftentimes be like inexplicable. So here we have the lava monkey men and they're all creating lava and then throwing it like a huge fireball. See, they're making a fireball. I think they're throwing it at Isom here and then he's getting ready to get engulfed in fire, but then this happens and what this is, is I don't know. The fire's coming and then this happens. So that that's good. And then, uh, what? I don't know. And then he says, uh, what are you? And she says, what are you? Uh, neither of these people have done very much data collection or research. Uh, we'll talk later. Let's get through the cave. So far, uh, Bloodruth has done effectively zero. Uh, there is nothing that Bloodruth has done at all, except for bring him to the cave. Uh, she's done nothing. She's contributed nothing to this at all. Uh, a monkey starts humping her right here. And then, uh, he kicks the monkey off of her. Uh, and then I uh, says, uh, I don't know, man. Unreal. And then he points to this, which I don't know what it is, but he says that has to be something. I guess, yeah. All of this has to be something. Do you understand? I, I had to read this today. Cognitive uh, minority says I'm exhausted. I don't. I understand. I, I had to read this. This is it's 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 really unfun. Uh, more monkey fighting. If you're looking for action, if you want to see ice on fighting the monkeys, like there are pages and pages of him fighting the monkeys, so that's good. Uh, and then once again. Uh, we got another kind of I as she uh, uses blood. This time she uses her blood to break down the door. And inside the door, and look, she's falling down because she's given all her blood away. Essentially, these are really bad powers because, um, especially if you're anemic. Uh, she goes inside and there are all these dead people. They're all dead, she says. But here's Sam. They were dead before I got here. Are you Sam? I am. And it looks like he's been raped, uh, which is uh, weird, but there's a lot of, of implication of that uh, in this book. So Sam was raped. Uh, that must be Avery out there causing a commotion. He said his name was Isom. I don't care, dude. I don't fucking care anymore. Why did they get Sam? Like, Oh, on the back of Sam's back. This is a clue. Looks like they clawed his back. Oh, look, look, look. It's lit up now. Is that important? It's a little symbol on his back. Oh, they're probably going to use Sam as a weapon. 
Okay. Uh, and uh, then she squirts out some more menstrual blood for Sam to jump into. And Blop, uh, they're... I don't know, guys. I'm, like, defeated, you know? Isom says, go. And he's holding off the monkeys while uh, Bloodruth, who is now out of blood, and she's tired. Uh, Sam helps her towards the hole. And uh, there's some monkeys in the way. I don't know. And uh, I don't know what... Oh, the animals come in. This is good. This is heroic. The wolves come in. Her wolves are animals, and they're magic. And so they help defeat some more monkey men. And then her dragons come in. That's cool. That's cool. I like Eric kind of going, you know what? Like, there's this chick, and she's got, like, wolves. And she's got, like, a dragon. And she's got, like, an eagle. She's got, like, alligators. She lives in a fucking castle. And she's a cowgirl. I like that. And she has blood powers. Dude, that is sweet. <clears throat> uh... The monkey man grabs Isom. He's about to set him on fire. Isom uses some powers, I guess. Like, he, he scrunches down. Then he jumps and bonks the guy's head on the roof of the cave, which frees him but leaves him falling. And then, uh, boom. By the way, uh, shout out to Eric Weathers. Boom. So he had all this to, like, uh, hey, see these lines here? Eric, I'm going to need Eric Weathers. I'm going to, he's the letter. I'm going to need a boom sound effect here. And Eric came through big time, man. And here is, uh, I saw him getting ready to be mounted. Probably by one of the monkey men. And then he gets up and I guess he decides he doesn't want to do that. And he runs away at the end. This is <laughs> a song. The end. Acknowledgements. Hope you enjoyed ISOM number two. Let me give a big shout out to those that stuck around. <laughs> uh, and we hope you remain customers of the Ripoverse. Well, you're asking a lot. ISOM number one let us gauge the market and we can now invest in other stories. The following years will bring books that will feature other characters detached from ISOM. These releases will consist of a growing pool of talented writers and artists. This is perhaps my favorite part of this entire process. Uh, this company is self-sufficient, which means that everything is connected. The more we grow, the more job opportunities there will be in all the departments of the company. That's great. You guys want to work there? Job opportunities are coming. On behalf of the Ripaverse, thanks to the greatest customers in the world, and we get another signature from Eric July. Another one. Eric, why don't you just limit these to maybe one per book? Why don't you expound upon your plans just once? Yeah, I don't want to see your signature more than once. And then we turn the page and look. Uh, next up, ice on number three and the conclusion of ill-advised. still Is he still going to be fighting the monkey men in three? Please say no. Please say psych. And then... And then we're back in the comic again. Like, we think it's over, but it's not over. We're back in the comic again. I've underestimated this, dot, 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 human. More vagaries. Our presence is no longer necessary. All has been confirmed. Oh, so um, very much like uh, Lincoln and very much like Darren, like you just set up shop. Uh, and um, for no particular reason except to confirm information. That's every, Everybody's collecting data. Everybody's getting things confirmed. Everybody is need, needs more research. That's the theme, the through line of this entire book is just people looking for more information. And then we got this. <laughs> he must be eliminated. Well, I mean... You just now came to that conclusion because you just sicked 400 monkey men on him that seemed to be trying to eliminate him, but they failed to do so. Did you know before, like, that he needed to be eliminated? 
if you didn't know that he needed to be eliminated, why did you send all your monkey men after him to try to kill him? Because they were trying to kill him. He's got now he's going to, you're going to, oh yeah. All right. Now you're mad. I, I, I don't care. Up next for the Ripiverse. I like this. I like the, uh, the ad on the inside of the, I'm trying to figure out how big he is. He seems like he's big, but I can't really tell. Like these are his feet and then they're all right. I mean, are these his feet? And there's his hand. And these are dead monkey men on the ground. He's not really that big. It'd be good to see little monkey men down here around him, like very small. Where are your little monkey men? And then you could say, holy shit, that dude's big. If that dude says he's going to be eliminated, I'm scared. It's just a monkey man, but he's wearing like a cape. Here we have an ad for uh, Chuck Dixon and Joe Bennett's Alpha Core, which I, people say, well, it's going to be better because, uh, you know, it's got Chuck Dixon and Joe Bennett. And I got to be honest with you. I, I you know, I, I don't know what the purpose is of this exercise without Eric July's direct involvement. Because the characters ain't nothing to write home about. Like, I mean, honestly, Alpha Core and their activities in this book made them absolutely insufferable assholes who uh, rape each other. And um, I, uh, I, I don't care. Like, it's not like, oh, I, I need to know more about them. Um, let's get, let's get a talented creative team involved. Like, I, I, these guys are fine, but let them do their own thing. Please free them to do their own book together somewhere else or about something else. $35. $35.